Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Muhammad Dini Zudin and I'm from group 1. Uh, she is uh, Aina, Farisa, Haikal, Azam, Sharifuddin. So basically, uh, today we are going to present about nano nano composite method of fabrication. So first of all, before we going through our slide, what is nano composite? Who can answer it? Sister, brother? Anyone? I will answer it myself. <laughs> what is nano composite? Nano composite are materials that uh, have a solid structure uh, in which the distance between the face uh, between the face is formed from uh, dimension uh, in in nanoscale size so uh, general form of an inorganic inorganic matrix and uh, organic organic phase or the opposite way from organic matrix in the inorganic phase so that's basically a rough idea about about nano composite so let's move to the next slide so, number one, definition. Nano composite is a material that is consisting of a base material or material or matrix uh, and nanoparticles uh, dispersed within it. Number two, nanoparticles. Nanoparticles is, are particles with dimension on the nanoscale. So basically, we all know nanoscale, right? Uh, nanoscale is between 1 to 100 nanometers. Uh, uh, they, can be, they, they can be derived from several materials. For example, uh, metals, polymer, ceramic, and carbon-based carbon -based material. For example, like uh, nanotube and graphene. Number three, Matrix material. Uh, the matrix material serves as a bulk component of uh, nano composite, uh, and it's usually is a polymer, ceramic, metal, or combination of those three things. Uh, the matrix uh, provi provide uh, provide a structural integrity to the nano composite. Number four, which is don't have in this slide, uh, dispersion. Nano nanoparticles disperse in uh, matrix material, forming a homogeneous structure, uh, achieve, achieve, achieving a good dispersion is crucial to maximize the benefit of nano composite. Number five, enhancement of Enhancement property. Uh, the incorporation of nanoparticles uh, is uh, the cooperation of nanoparticles give unique properties to the nano composite. Uh, for example, uh, improve mechanical strength, uh, uh, electrical conductivity, thermal stability. Um, uh, chemical resistant or optical properties. So I think that's all from me. I will pass to the next presenter. Uh, okay, the next one is I'll be talking about what is fabrication. So what is fabrication on the first place? So okay, uh, fabrication is basically a process of creating or manufacturing something by skillfully assembling it, shaping, or manipulating the materials or component. So basically, it's from a raw materials or semi-finished products. We transform it into finished goods or complete products. So basically, in this case, we probably have polymer or na and nanomaterials and transform it using various fabrication techniques that are available. So, and this is a couple of examples of fabrication techniques that are available. There's more than this, actually, but we will 
uh, group one will only explain about two, which is mixing and soil gel method. There's also other example of fabrication technique, which is solution mixing. We have electro spinning, we have in situ polymerization, and we also have layer la layer by layer assembly and others. Uh, this basically like 3D printing and so on. So next slide. Uh, why we need to do fabrication to produce an air composite? Why is it so important for us to do fabrication technique? So the first one is enhance the properties of the materials. So nanocomposite basically when we produce nanocomposite, it enhances the properties of materials, making it more good or better than the traditional material than before. So it's basically increase the mechanical strength of it, increase the thermal stability, and so on. And the second one is lightweight and energy efficiency. As we know that nanocomposite is a light materials, but it's strong. It it's a strong things. So basically, it has a high strength ratio to the weight. So basically, even though it's light, it has a high strong, high strength. So this is will be so useful in the like vehicles industry, like automotive industry, aerospace industry. Because why is it energy efficiency? When your vehicles is light, you will use less energy consumption because it's lighter than the previous one. So it will use less energy. So at the same time, it can save the, save the environment as well by using less fuel. And the third one is tailored material properties. So basically, ta tailored material properties is uh, when you have a nanomaterial and you go through it through specific uh, specific fabrication technique, we, you will get a specific nanomaterial, nanocomposite. <coughs> For example, you have cellulose, you go through the fabrication technique of cellulose, you get nanocellulose. So you basically get what you want, so that's what telematerial properties. And the fourth one is versatility and multifunctionality. When you have a nanomaterials that combine with other nanomaterials and produce a nanocomposite, the nanocomposite will have a simultaneously multifunction. Basically, it will have two different functions at the same composite because you already combine it. And the fourth one is scalability and manufacturing. So it basically, you have a various technique of fabrication like I showed earlier. So you will, it will help the industry to produce more uh, nanocomposite materials. So it's cost efficient and time and so on. And the last one is a new application and innovation. As you all know, that nano is a huge shield of opportunities that can be explored in nano field. So it's a new application and innovation that can be created from nano. So right, next one. OK, now we will look into the methods of fabrication of nanocomposites, which are melt mixing and soil gel method. OK, the first one is melt mixing. Uh, melt mixing refers to the process of incorporating nanoscale particles such as nanoparticles or nanofillers into a molten polymer matrix and this process is used to produce nanocomposites which are composite materials with enhanced properties due to the dispersion and the distribution of nanoparticles uniformly within the molten polymer. And this process typically involves these seven steps which are selection of nanoparticles, preparation of nanoparticles, polymer melting, nanoparticle incorporation, mixing and dispersion, cooling and solidification, and post-processing. Okay, so the first step is to select uh, suitable nanoparticles or nanofillers that can enhance the desired properties of the polymer. We need to choose the appropriate nanoparticles uh, based on the desired properties and the compatibility with the polymer matrix. And these nanoparticles can be either metallic ceramic, carbon-based, or organic in nature, depending on the desired properties and the applications of the nanoparticles. Uh, other than nanoparticles, we also need to select uh, a polymer matrix that is suitable for the applications. For example, polyethylene, polypropylene, uh, polystyrene, PVC, and others. Okay, so the second step is the preparation of nanoparticles. The nanoparticles need to be properly prepared before mixing with the polymer melt. Um, depending on the nature of nan nanoparticles, uh, they may require pretreatment to improve their dispersion and their compatibility with the polymer matrix. Um, commonly, surface modifications or 
functionalizations are performed to improve their compatibility and to enhance their interactions with the polymer matrix. And the next step is polymer melting. We need to apply heat to the mixture to melt the polymer. And the polymer, the polymer matrix are usually comes in the form of pellets or granules. So they will be melted using conventional techniques such as extrusion or injection molding. And we need to set the temperature according to the, to the melting point of the uh, polymers that we use. For example, if we use uh, polypropylene uh, as our polymers, we need, we need to set the temperature to 180 degrees Celsius, which is the melting point of the polymer. I'm going to continue about the nanoparticle incorporation. As the polymer melt reach the desired temperature, the, nanopart the prepared nanoparticle is then added into the mixture by using a method of direct, uh, direct mixing and soluble and solution. Uh, the next step is mixing and dispersion. The polymer melt is then put into in intense mechanical mixing by using a double screw extruders. This will help uh, the dispersion to be more equally and ensure good interaction between nanoparticle and polymer. And lastly, the polymer melt is then put into cooling and solidification. The polymer melt is then uh, put into cooling, then become composite melt, and it is cooled by using the method of uh, air cooling and water quenching. Uh, after the nanocomposite is, uh, has become solid, it is then shaped into the uh, into the desired product by using the method of cutting and milling. And as Daniel has said, the successful incorporation during the process is crucial to achieve the desired enhancements such as mechanical, thermal, electricity, and a lot of other functions, which can be achieved uh, by carefully monitoring and controlling the mixing time, temperature, uh, which will ensure the effective dispersion and prevent agglomeration of nanoparticles within, uh, within the polymer matrix. All right, so next I'm going to present about the second method, which is the soil gel process. So soil gel process is a chemical method for synthesis of various nanostructures. In this method, uh, molecular, in this method, molecular precursor will dissolve in water or alcohol, and then it will be converted to gel um, uh, by, by heating or stirring by hydrolysis or alcoholysis. Since the gel is obtained from the hydrolysis or alcoholysis, so the product obtained will be wet or damp, so it needs to be dried uh, with um, suitable conditions according to the desired products or the desired products or the properties that they want to obtain. All right, and then <clears throat> after the gel is dried, then it will be powdered and uh, then it will be powdered. Okay, and then this figure, this figure uh, shows the overall process of the, from the precursor to the gel, uh, to the gel. Okay, and then <clears throat> uh, for the synthesis of binary or tertiary hybrid systems, um, <clears throat> a mixture of salts with different chemical components is used. So each of the primary salts has different um, reaction rate. So the reaction rate of its uh, salts is depend on the pH, concentration, temperature, and the type of solvent. Okay, and then <clears throat> type of solvent. Um, so the polymer gel form from the density of the cell uh, is by joining the cavities, and since it is uh, due to its volumetric shrinkage, um, <clears throat> due to its volumetric shrinkage, uh, a solid and rigid object will be obtained. Okay, and then um, solid and rigid object will be obtained. Uh, so by controlling the conditions, it will be possible to obtain a nano size of por porous. Eh, Nano size of porous materials. 
Okay, so what is the advantage of nanoporous materials is that it has a larger surface area than the normal size of the nanoporous materials. Okay, then, okay, this figure sh uh, shows the SEM image of the nano size, nanoparticles of the porous. Okay, mm, okay, so the conversion from salt to gel, salt to gel, is converted by changing the pH and the concentration of the solution. It is also um, used a variety of techniques, but mostly use the gentle, <coughs> gentle drying to remove the solvent. Okay, and then um, <coughs> gentle drying from the solvent. Um, gentle drying of the solvent. Okay, and then. Um, um, So by providing the okay, so since the gel obtained is uh, accompanied by its shrinkage, shrinkage, so we have to be careful with the temperature condition so that it will not crack, so that it will be easy for it to for it to oh, for it to. Um, it will be easy for it to cast for casting and molding. Uh, for casting and molding, so the products that is ob obtained from the casting and molding um, can be used as a membranes, and it will it can also create a thin film around fifty to five hundred nanometers. So because of that, there are different coating process such as. Capillary coating process, flow coating process, spray coating process, and others. Okay, next. So as you guys can see from this picture here, the soldier method uh, is required a lot of process. This soldier method is uh, can produce uh, composite and nano composite. So for this purpose, continuous porosity at uh, nano scale is required to. Uh, Loading up secondary materials. Loading means uh, it's adding substance to the cavity of the materials. So, the uh, example of the nanocomposite is nanoporous, uh, which is nanoporous is uh, actually commonly used as a catal in the catalytic industries. Uh, the pores of the nanoporous contains a lot and variety of uh, industrial catalysts which uh, due to the due to the uh, large uh, surface active size uh, it is due to the large active uh, size of the surface area it is uh, easier for the catalyst and it will increase the efficiency of the catalytic and decrease the cost of the product to make. So basically, it means that this uh, <coughs> nanoforest is a catalyst, which we, use, which we know that uh, it used in the, a lot of process, right? And it, it functions as a, uh, to increase the efficiency of the process and will make the uh, product easier. So for the next one is uh, the, the this picture shows that the loading of the secondary particles into the nanoporous materials, and the to make the material denser, we to make the uh, to make the material denser, it. To make the material denser, it, are, it requires a lot of process and uh, ah, like that. Ah. So uh, the so for the Last one, uh, it, 
show the overview of the uh, soldier method uh, and the process and the product that we acquired from this process. For example, as you guys can see here, if we coating the material, it will give us a dense film. And if we do a gel gelatation and evaporation, it will do it will make a zero gel. And if we super critical drying it, it will become an aerogel. And if we do precipitation, it will become uni uniform powder. And if we do a spinning, it will become a uh, fiber. Understand, right? I think that's all from us. Thank you. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We from group two will present about nano composite characterization technique. Um, our group consists from Akmal, Iqbal, Ilyasa, Farah, and Saliha, and me, Fawaz. Okay. Um, first, what is nano composite? I will step forward. Nano composite uh, basically is the modified nano material. Modified nano material. Modified nano material in nano size. Okay, and this nano composite divide into three types. First, we have uh, matrix. We have polymer matrix. Second, metal matrix, and the third one. Metal, metal matrix, polymer matrix. And the third one is and the third one is others. I think. Okay. And then the researchers actually uh, do the research to to define the nano composite characterization by uh, several techniques. Um, they do this because to studies about the structural, uh, the structure, the composition, and also the properties of the nano material in nano size. And the two types of the two types of characterization technique that we uh, want to explain to all of you, we have first uh, SRD, or we call X-ray diffraction. And then the second one, we have uh, TEM, T -E -M, which is trans transmission electron microscopy. And this choice of the technique actually depends on how the researchers want to interest to studies about the nanomaterials. Um, so next, I will talk about the objective of the nano composite characterization. So there are two uh, objectives, which is the first one is structural analysis, um, characterizing characterizing the structural aspect of nano composite um, involve um, the composition of um, materials, including um, matrix material and nanoparticles. So by understanding the structural analysis. Um, we can know the um, composition materials and the um, crystallography um, of nano composite. So the second one is performance optimization. So the ultimate uh, objective of this purpose is to optimize the performance of nano composite, um, which is. Uh, so uh, by understanding this, um, the, re the, the researchers can uh, modify or, or synthesize the methods of nanoparticles. So um, it will enhance the um, nanocomposite applications. So I will talk about uh, how XRD works. X-ray diffraction or XRD 
uh, is a powerful technique used to study a crystallographic uh, structure, including nanocomposite, including nanocomposite. So XRD works by XRD works by irradiating a, a XRD works by irradiating a material with incident X-ray, with incident X-ray, uh, and then measuring the. And then measuring the measuring the the intensity and the uh, scattering angle. A uh, primary use of the uh, SRD analysis is uh, uh, is the identification of the materials is the identification of the materials um, uh, based on their diffraction patterns. So as you can see in the picture, here is how... First, <laughs> 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 Uh, as you can see in the picture here is how SRD used uh, in nanocomposite characterization. So diffraction occurs when diffraction occurs when X-ray diffraction occurs when intense when incident X-ray. Diffraction occurs when incident X-ray um, constructively uh, interfere in with a crystalline solid, with a crystalline solid. Uh, so when the X-ray, uh, when the X-ray uh, reflect off a set of planes uh, in a crystalline structure, uh, constructive interference will uh, occurs when the path difference between the X-ray uh, is equal to the lambda wavelength. So, SRD can determine a uh, SRD can determine a uh, crystal structure, crystal structure and different phases in uh, nanocomposite. So. As usual, no. Usually, uh, uh, with increasing the plane indices or higher angle uh, or higher angle in the pattern, uh, it will in, uh, the intensities the intensity of the peak will go down or decrease.
So for the second method of crystal structure analysis, by using this graph uh, from the X-ray diffraction, uh, there is three valuable information that researchers will get. The first, the crystal structure of the material itself. Second, the lattice parameter. And third is the crystal light size. The crystal structure will determine uh, the shape of the atom arrangement in the molecule, whether it's going to be tetragonal, hexagonal, cubic, and so on. Second, lattice parameter. Lattice parameter will determine the size and shape by uh, referring to the lattice un uh, to the unit cell. Uh, unit cell, which is the uh, okay, uh, which is apa tadi ya? Ha. Will, uh, will determine the size and shape uh, of the crystal unit cell refer, uh, repeating, uh, referred to the repeating unit of the crystal lattice by, uh, by measuring the crystal, uh, crystal lattice unit we will, uh, the, research, the researchers will get the uh, what we call the specific uh, arrangement of the atom in that material and last uh, the crystal light size uh, the crystal light size is the uh, dimension of the individual uh, individual unit cell of the atom uh, by sabar jap ah uh, what lah aku tak tahu so basically uh, using this graph from the x-ray diffraction the researchers will basically uh, draw the uh, that particular material, the atom arrangement of the material. Uh, last uh, degree of crystal degree of crystallinity. Uh, uh, degree of crystallinity is very important because just now they already may, uh, they already get the shape, the size of the arrangement. The present of crisp, uh, in the material, we have crystalline and amorphous phase. That uh, X-ray diffraction will only react to the crystalline phase, as amorphous will not give any reaction. So by okay, uh, we are they will plot the graph of intensity. Because uh, we uh, we want to know the higher the intensity of the crystalline region in the material, it will affect the thermal uh, the thermal electrical and the hardness. Because uh, the the because the higher the intensity of the crystalline phase in the material, it will be harder. Uh, enhance electrical conductivity and better thermal conductivity. So that's all. So now I'm going to talk about transmission, <coughs> transmission electron microscopy. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about transmission electron microscopy. So it, it is actually a technique which electron beams is passed on to a specific specimen to form an image. So you can say that it uses electron electron beam to recall to to examine uh, the internal structure of the specimen uh, using nanoscale. So this TEM is also used by researchers and scientists as to find the structure of uh, protein, polymers, and crystals. As you can see over here, these are the uh, about 10 components in this transmission electron microsco microscopy. And this is the example of uh, electron micro diffraction. Okay. 
So before that, I'm, uh, we are going to, uh, me and Sal here, we are going to talk about the ways to characterize nanocomposites. So firstly is morphology and particle size analysis. So I'm going to split those two words into two parts, morphology and particle size analysis. So what is morphology? Morphology is uh, size and shape of particles. And particle size analysis is um, a distribution of size and shapes of particles inside a specimen. OK, so what is the relationship between morphology and particle size analysis between and TEM? OK, so there, when we use TEM, the morphology and particle size analysis will take an impact to, to get more detailed and precise shape and size of the particle inside the specimen. So um, uh, it is to provide more qualitative uh, image of morphology of a particle itself. So what? So I shortened the particle size analysis to PSA. What? When we combine um, TEM and PSA, we'll get um, uh, detail and more um, explanation regarding the characteristics of the particle itself, such as the um, uh, density, strength, uh, and reactivity when we react to another solution. So I'll pass an, the mic to Sister Saleha for more another two characteristics. Okay, so moving on, we will examine the interface. So basically, the TM will help visualize the interface between the nanoparticles and the matrix material. So it will help us provide insights on the particle and matrix matrix interaction. As, a, as an example, the interfacial, interfacial bonding, the interfacial bonding, interdiffusion, and, the, and we can even detect possible defects on the interface. So, lastly, we will, um, we will get to determine the crystalline structure and orientation. So how we can determine it? By using the SAED. So basically, SAED is actually stands for Selected Area Electron Diffraction. So basically, this, this SAED, SAED pattern will help us reveal the orientation and the symmetry of the symmetry of the crystallites in the crystallites in the nano in the individual nanoparticles so that's all from me So, in conclusion, the objective of nano-composite characterization uh, revolves around uh, understanding the structural, morphological, um, and functional aspect to assess the quality, and then the performance, and also the applicability of nano-composites. And this characterization, actually, it helps researchers in optimizing material synthesis and then uh, make new design new applications and also advancing advance the field of nano composite technology 
Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, for today, uh, our group will be presenting uh, 3D printing, but we'll be going deeper into FDM, which is Fuse Deposition Modeling. So I'm going to be your first presenter. My name is Alia Anusha. And my name is Muhammad Ishamuddin. Amir Hafiz Bahanizan. Uh, my name is Manu Ilham. <laughs> my name is Nur Aisha. And my name is Nuri Afika. Okay, so I'm going to be your first presenter. I'm going to be explaining to you what is 3D printing. So basically, as you can see here, this is going to be your basic 3D printer and you can see the parts of the 3D printer. So 3D print, uh, printing is basically an addition manufacturing in constructing a three-dimensional object from a CAD model or computer-aided uh, model or a digital 3D model. So the form uh, of the substance that is used to create a 3D model or 3D printing, the form is either in powder grains, liquids or plastics. So then this 3D, uh, the substance is then formed, fused together, uh, solidified or joined together, layer by layer. Okay. okay, have you guys seen this movie before? Okay, so this is a group of women. <laughs> you can go back home and watch it. So um, you can... Look at this movie. So this is a good example, not a really good example, but it's an example of how 3D printing is used. So this group of women try to steal this necklace. It's a luxurious necklace from a museum. So they use a 3D printing. So as I said before, they make this necklace layer by layer under a computer control. As you can see, it's used under computer control. They print it out as the same way as you print out paper. So they make this so it's 3d you can hold it you can touch it and it's going to look exactly as the replica of the original ones this is the fake one they are going to switch the fake one with the real one and they're going to sell it so basically when you're selling a luxurious necklace it's going to cost millions right so that is also one example of how to remember 3d printing so as you all know the locals know this is called kuih lapis so i mean you're an industrial student this is called kuih lapis so probably you can remember 3d printing Basically, it is a fusion of a substance, uh, joined or solidified together, layer by layer. So I'm going to pass it on to the next presenter. Okay, uh, I will move on to the what is FDM. Okay, FDM is uh, an acronym for Fusion Deposition Modeling, or uh, we call it uh, we call it as, as uh, FFF. Uh, what is FFF? This Fusion Filament. Of, uh, Fabrication, ah, uh, yeah. So, uh, what is uh, this thing? Okay, this thing is a three D printing process that uses a continuous filament of thermoplastic material. Okay, previously we learned about thermoplastic, right? Ah, uh, so this FDM is about thermoplastic, uh, uh, thermoplastic material. Okay, uh, and then it's printing uh, for the 3D. Okay, so uh, this is the most uh, popular and most po uh, most popular and used in the industry. Uh, okay, uh, before that, this is the simple uh, FDM Prusa One, uh, not One. It is I3. Okay, you can Google. Yeah, you can Google later on. Okay, uh, for this part is uh, an extruder that, you know, uh, uh, this is the part, uh, uh, some part of the FDM. Okay, so the, you know, the filament will go into inside this and then we, uh, the filament will, uh, what we call, go out uh, to the extrusion. Okay, uh, and then we move it. Uh, what? Uh, where do you do we want? Okay. Uh, so this is uh, uh, that's all lah. This is you know simple. Uh, simple. Okay. Uh, the material is about. Uh, we know we have uh, seven material there. We have uh, ABS, PLA, PETG, PET, heaps, uh, nylon, and uh, TPU. So uh, we'll pass to the next presenter. So um, I will explain about how the 3D printing works. So first of all, when we want to do a 3D printing, first we need to we need a model or we need to design the, design the model. So for, uh, we can design the model of 3D printing uh, by using the computer drawing. So uh, there are many types of computer drawings that we have. 
today, uh, which is one of one of it, one of its is uh, Tinkercad, AutoCAD, Solid, SolidWorks, and many more. So after we design the model, we need to slice in. We need to slice uh, the model into into a uh, numbers of layers in order to the 3D printing to able able to read uh, and able to printing the design that we desire. <coughs> so. Uh, we need to use the software, for example, uh, Ultimaker Cura. We can slice um, uh, uh, the design that we designed before using the uh, CAD drawing into um, my Ultimaker Cura, Cura, and then it will slice into several layers. And usually, every layer has a diameter of 0.1 millimeters to 0.3 millimeters. So, next is uh, extrusion process, which is um, we use thermoplastic uh, filament because we know that thermoplastic can be melted and can be, be shaped again. So <coughs> that's why we use uh, thermoplastic filament. So uh, we, we connect the filament into the extruder, which is the extruder is a component that melt the filament um, with a certain tem uh, melting temperature um, based on the uh, material filament that we use. And after that, after it reached the certain temperature, it will push down the molten um, filament um, through a small nozzle and will be um, pushed into the, uh, we call it printer bed. Printer bed. This is the printer bed. And this is a small nozzle, the heater block. This is where we heat the filament to, to, to make it become more viscous and molten material. So I'll pass to the next presenter. Uh, I will continue with the next step, which are layer by layer deposition and cooling and solidification. Layer by layer deposition uh, is a fundamental process in 3D printing where objects are gradually are brought gradually by depositing the by depositing one layer of material at a time. Um, this process allows for precise control over the object's shape, facilitating intricate designs and complex structures with high detail and accuracy. Layer thickness, print speed, and other printing parameters can be adjusted based on resolution, strength, and printing efficiency. The fourth step, which is cooling and solidification, um, is our essential process in 3D printing. After each layer is deposited, the heat dissipates, uh, causing the material to cool and solidify. So the last two steps are support structure and post processing. Support structures are temporary elements added during 3D printing to provide stability and prevent deformation of overhangs or complex geometries. It is usually uh, composed of the same material with the, to the main piece, but can be easily removed um, by hands or with tools. And the last step, uh, post-processing, uh, enhance 3D printed objects by refining their appearance and optimizing functionality. These uh, steps uh, include support removal, coating applications, improved performance, and surface smoothing. Um, the, these steps are actually to ensure the 3D printer object meets the requirement, meets the requirement applications, application, and also achieve uh, the desired finer quality and functionality. I'll continue. I'll pass to the next presenter. So now I want to talk about why 3D printing is being used. Uh, I want to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of the 3D printer. So the first one is affordable. Why 3D printer is affordable? Because we use uh, the material, the low cost material. For example, we use plastic, concrete that uh, easily access. So the second one is 3D printer is fast because uh, as we know, the 3D printers, uh, sometimes people use and build a house. So, uh, if we use the 3D printer, it's more fast than the manual one, uh, we use human. So, uh, the last one, we talk about uh, 3D printer can work with specialty materials. 
what is specialty materials instead of 3D printer can use the plastic, concrete and metal. 3D printer also can use uh, for gold fiber, carbon fiber. So uh, this is the advantages of the 3D printer. Okay, uh, the next one is disadvantages of 3D printer. First one is uh, 3D printer not provide enough strength. Uh, as we know, Ali Anusha also said that 3D printers is made layer by layer. So uh, once uh, we use 3D printers, it can uh, when we one 3D printer is made by layer by layer, so it can affect the durability and the strength of the product. Uh, the second one is have accuracy issue. Uh, uh, as uh, Isham said that uh, 3D printer we use uh, CAD, ma, ma, <coughs> we use uh, computer added drawing, so uh, it can it can happen uh, it can affect the accuracy. The last one it's require post processing. Uh, this is happen uh, because 3D printer uh, 3D printer. When uh, we make uh, one product, so 3D printer also have the <coughs> the also have the problem. So sometimes uh, the next product will will be the different from the first product. So I want to pass to the next one. Okay, Bismillah. Uh, first, I, I want to talk about design consideration. So, what is design consideration? Uh, actually, in 3D printing, uh, a lot of things we need to consider. Uh, uh, actually, uh, 3D printing also need, needs a cost to produce something and also energy to produce uh, the product. So, uh, this is the what we call uh, consideration. We need to think about it before we uh, produce our product. So the uh, the first one is uh, the first one is resolution. Uh, resolution is mean uh, the thickness of each layer. Um, well, when we uh, use uh, basically. Uh, the minimum uh, of thickness each layer is 1.6 millimeter. So, uh, if we use uh, the smaller or smaller smaller thickness of uh, each layer, it will become more uh, smooth. Uh, the layer will be smooth. Uh, but if we uh, use the lar larger resolution, it will become um, Sometimes we it will be not perfect. Yeah, it will be some holes and also rich uh, if we use a larger resolution. So the second one is uh, material. Uh, it depends on what uh, product, the characteristic of our product. Uh, if we want a, a the ordinary one, we can use ABS. Uh, ABS, or if you if you want to have a rubbery, what we call rubbery uh, characteristic, you can use polycarbonate. And also, if you want that product have a thermal resistance, you can use uh, ULTEM uh, or polyterimide. Okay, mm. uh, that's a, it's about material. Uh, the third one is orientation. Orientation that means uh, how our parts will be placed in in the at, at the surface to to produce the product. So uh, your product can be produced like this or can be stuck like this. But each orientation have energy consumption. So each uh, sometimes the orientation. Uh, some uh, some of the orientation may be have a high consumption of energy, but some of it uh, lost energy consumption. Uh, the fourth one is thickness. Uh, what I call 
thickness is uh, what I mean is thickness uh, wall thickness. Basically, um, if you want to uh, have a, a smaller thickness of your uh, your product, maybe like this, smaller, smaller, uh, you can do it. But uh, actually, it can it easily break or what we call brittle. Uh, <laughs> so basically like this, uh, if you want to uh, produce a small, small, small thickness of your product, you can do it. Uh, because uh, mm, low energy consumption and also easily do, uh, less, less hour uh, need to be used. Uh, okay, it's about thickness. Uh, last one is size. Size actually, actually is the part, first part. But I, I, sorry about sorry about that. So the size, so the maximum size that can produce from 3D printing, FDM 3D printing is uh, 16 inch times width 14 inch times width 16 inch. Ah, uh, it's quite it's quite large, but. If you want to make a larger than that scale, you need to break it to a part. Maybe like uh, have, I have a, um, uh, you want to make a, maybe example, robot. You need to break uh, like a uh, make a body first or and the hand first and the leg first, and then you may proceed to head and then you will assemble it into the final product with special procedures, uh, with, uh, special procedure. So that uh, they cannot be used uh, like, uh, using glue or other than that. So it have a procedure to assemble it. <laughs> uh, so that's all from us. Thank you very much for uh, having a time uh, to hear uh, our, to our presentation. So all the best for your final exam. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm from, uh, we are from group four. And now we are presenting about FDM 3D printing for issues, solutions, and features. So my name is Muhammad Daniel Fidaus. Uh, my name is Muhammad Afi. And my name is Muhammad Arif Daniel. My name is Nur Aina Kamarina. My name is Fatih Bahani. My name is Nuri Jenny. Then uh, let's move to the issues. So the first issues I will be explaining about rep, uh, warping and cracking. So uh, how warping and cracking can be done, uh, can be uh, created, is when you have uneven cooling. Uh, at it, what it means by uneven cooling is the outer part is uh, cool first and the inside still hot. So the material of uh, 3D FDM, we use thermoplastic. The characteristic, characteristic of the uh, thermoplastic is it expands uh, when it heated and it shrinks when it cool. So that's how we got the warping. Warping means uh, it lifts or cools from the uh, bed, from the uh, heating bed or the plate. Uh, while cracking mean uh, it deformation between layers. Uh, so this is cracking. Uh, so the second reason. Oh sorry. Oh sorry. I can see. Uh, the sec so the second reason uh, is the uh, poor adhesion between the heated bed and the product. So it will make this. Uh, not stick for, uh, to the, from the heated bed. We make it lift or curl. Uh, and then the third reason is the material, of course. The material, uh, thermoplastic have a lot of materials. So uh, ABS uh, it have, less, have more tendency to become warping more than uh, PLA. Why? Because ABS, uh, the thermal expansion is higher. So when it cool down, it will uh, it will easier to get this 
this kind of string. So uh, some of the product that have a warping and cracking of this uh, ha that have this issue, this kind of issue, some of it can be used, and some of it can be used at all. Uh, for example, which uh, can be used if you have a water bottle and that uh, it have a crackings, so it will have water le uh, water leakage, right? And some of some of a uh, product that uh, still can be used. Uh, for instance, this this uh, phone casing. Uh, if it is if it, it has warping, and of course it still can be used, but it's very look unprofessional. Uh, uh, so the, if the Apple make a product with unprofessional look, it will ruin their uh, their image. Then I uh, will pass to the next person. Okay, next, uh, I will explain about the product stringing and curling. Uh, this is an issue of the 3 printing. Uh, all the things uh, in the world have the disadvantage, and this issue have. Uh, uh, F, well known, well known. And first, I will explain about the stringing. Uh, the stringing is like this. The stringing uh, occur when the two parts of the printed uh, and the material plastic of the 3D printing have a defect because it has a track uh, like this. It's a stringing product and it's a defect of the stringing. It is because uh, because of the high temperature uh, and the position of the nozzle is too close to the to the product of the printed part. And then I will explain about the curling. And you can see the curling is like a curl curl product, and it occurs because of the layer at the middle of the layer sunken. And then the temperature is too high too, uh, and the product is not is melted at a high temperature and does not have a sufficient time to cool down and be a, like a curling product. And then I will explain about the elephant foot. As you can see, it's like a elephant foot, and the elephant foot. It's a defect of the expansion of the layer part and, and at the horizontal plane. It is because the nozzle is too close to the, to the product uh, when it's printed. And then the temperature might to be too high for this product, uh, for the material, material uh, ABS, PLA, have their temperature. And we need to use the temperature has that has been that has been manufactured. Thank you. Uh, I will pass to the next presenter. Um, for the next is how uh, to prevent the resin cleaning from the cracking. First of all, uh, we need to store the resin correctly. Like, uh, don't uh, expose the resin to the sunlight because in sunlight we you know we, uh, in sunlight we have UV light, right? So UV light uh, when exposed to the to the printed resin, um, it uh, we call it uh, the resin is become brittle and is the effect the performance of the resin and the next is uh, we need to use the good workiness for example um, the minimum the minimum i will use is um, for the wall is 2 mm but we can increase to the 2.5 until 3 because uh, the the good wall thickness is become the product or the model become the strong enough to hold the weight of the product and the third is uh, increase the normal exposure. Um, 
if the noble exposure time is too low, we will experience the um, under exposure, and it's be uh, the model become the become filler and be, um, become uh, like. Uh, like e easy to correct, and then uh, for the specific um, model, uh, we, if we use the low normal exposure time, and the model is easily to to crack and also make a hole, and the lastly, you avoid printing parts too thin. As I mentioned, the, we need to use uh, good wall thickness uh, because the some of the pro product model uh, need to have uh, some, uh, like some part we uh, use the small, uh, like a thin wall. But if you have a good design, you have a good skill to make the, have a good skill, you can make the thin part to become become thicker. And next, uh, how to fix hole? If the, we already do the model and we need to fix the hole, okay. First of all, uh, we need to use the filler material. Uh, we can use epoxy wood filler to fill the hole and let let it dry. And we need to sand it to and apply prime or also paint to make it uh, suitable to the, the surrounding. And next, we need to apply heat. Uh, we apply it to the some of the cracking, uh, the edge of the cracking to make it the small because smaller and less noticeable. And also, and next, uh, we use the hot glue gun. When hot glue gun, uh, when it's small, when the hole is too small, we can use the hot glue to fill the hole and and this will dry quickly, right? And it become uh, become a solid seal. And last but not least, uh, use a support structure. If the cracking uh, is too big and cannot be filled by the filament, uh, we need to make some support structure to re to, to cover the cover the cracking. Like we need to use the plastic filament and also metal rod to give the su support to make the cracking strong. Okay, I think that's all for me. Next, for the next innovation to solve a 3D printing problem is monitor the temperature. Uh, when the temperature is too high, it can um, it can cause a print imperfect, uh, such as ringing, curling, and elephant foot. So, firstly, we need to set up the temperature based on the material that we use. This is because a uh, different material has their basic ideal temperatures. So this is the basic ideal temperature for PLA, ABS, PETG, and TPU. Uh, next, um, a thermistor. A thermistor is a component in your printer that specifically reads the temperature. Uh, if it doesn't work well, it cannot uh, give the. Uh, it can read the temperature wrong. So one way to check uh, whether the thermistor is working fine is by using hot glue gun or hair dryer to blast hot air to the hot tank. So if you can see the temperature rise on the control panel and then it may be working fine so you don't have to change it with a new one. And for the last one is cartridge heater. Cartridge heater is a component that transferring heat in your printer. Uh, if it's not working fine, uh, it cannot transfer heat into your printer and the temperature cannot give exact reading for your printing. And for the conclusion, uh, we must uh, ensure all the temperature component is in a good condition to avoid any problem in your print 3D printing. So... Uh, what is the future of FDM 3D printing? The first one is in medical applications. And the first is bioprinting complex tissue and organs. Uh, FDM 3D printing is uh, revolutionizing 
in in the in the field of the bioprinting that involve in the fabrication of living tissue and organ with the ability with the ability to preciously deposit bio in layer by layer fbm technology fbm technology uh, opens up possibility for creating complex and functional tissue Can you imagine the future where the patient who need uh, organ transplant no need to wait a longer for a donor because they can receive a custom-made organ produced by FDM 3D printing uh, that match with the anatomy. So it can reduce the risk of radiation and improving overall compatibility. And then the second is personalized medical device and prosthetic. FDN technology allow for the production of personalized medical device and prosthetic that intricate design and a perfect fit for uh, individual patients. Um, tradi <laughs> traditional manufacturing uh, often struggle to meet the Unique, unique requirement for each patient. So, uh, with the FDM 3D printing, it is possible to create a custom made device such as uh, hearing aid, dental implants, or other orthopedic implants. And then, uh, the last one is what? advantages of FDN in medical application. The first one is um, FDM can create personalized medical solutions for patients and then uh, FDM, FDM is more affordable compared to other study printing. And then the last one is FDM technology can produce um, can produce medical device and prosthetic very quickly by allowing for rapid delivery and reduce waiting time. Um, next is the FDM in construction application. Um, as we know that Construction application in 3D printing is the, namely as the C3DP construction 3D printing or the 3D construction printing 3DCP. Uh, 3DCP is the refer to various technology that use 3D printing as a core method to fabricate construction to fabricate construction or building compo components. Um, same like we use 3D CP to additive, component, additive construction. In 3D CP, we use the two kind of technology that is robot thread and robot crawler. Robot thread is a, robot thread is a 3D printer that is stationary in one place and make a 3D, 3D printing in on the on the one place only. While the robot crawler is a mobile 3D printing that make a 3D printing uh, from one place to another place. That means that robot crawler can be can move anywhere in any kind of the any kind of the place and tdcp also we use material that are suitable for the purpose of the building being developed for example like this picture uh, it's named that it's named the tecla house t-e-c-l-a uh, it made from the clay because the the purpose of the 
the clock house is just an emergency construction, emergency house. And uh, if the the clock house being destroyed, the clay can be used into the another TDCP. And next is advantage of FTM in construction application. Is first is cost effective that we we no need to waste our money to more material construction or the workers and save a lot of construction time like the like this Tecla house it can make in less 200 hours uh, less is a, a variety of design choice where we can make construction where any kind of shape that we want like Tecla is a round shape Next is this advantage of FTM in construction application. First is limited material. As we know that if we make construction in less less number of the material, the construction is less uh, less strong and not strong enough lah. Uh, next is to uh, leave a negative impact on workers because the workers will completely depend on the technology, 3D technology. And the technology will destroy if if exposed the, to the bad weather. Um, that's all from us. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. We are from Group 5. And today we are going to present about sustainability in nanocomposite and 3D printing. And my name is Haris. This one is Gushayri, Zakwan, Haikal, Tanvir, and Afiq. So without any delay, go on to the first slide. What is nanocomposite? So we're going to recap a little bit. A nanocomposite is a, is a material that consists of matrix or base material. Uh, with nanoparticles dispersed around it. In simple words, a nanocomposite, a nanocomposite combines two or more, two or more materials. With at least one of it is a uh, nanomaterials with different physical and chemical properties. So we go on to the next one. Uh, the sustainability of nanocomposite. So the first one, environmental impact. So nanocomposite can offer uh, sustainability benefits by reducing the non-renewable resources and improving energy efficiency. For example, a lightweight nanocomposite material can contribute to energy saving in transportation. The second one is resource efficiency. Nanocomposite have the potential to enhance resource efficiency, resource efficiency by improving the performance and durability of materials. This can lead to materials consumption and waste generation. I will pass on to the next presenter. So for the next two sustainable <coughs> of the composite is, for the third one is social consideration. So uh, social consideration uh, in the terms of uh, open, it means social dimension of sustainability involves considering the well-being of equity to uh, individu individuals and communities. So in the terms of nanocomposite, we can see that uh, it is important to address for the occupational, occupational health and safety concerns associated with the production and handling of nanoparticles. Uh, so for the fourth one is, uh, we, can see, uh, we can look there, life cycle assessment, which is LCA. So basically, LCA is conducting a life cycle assessment. It's a valuable tool for evaluating the sustainability of nanocomposite. Uh, from this, uh, we know that LCA allows to the com comprehensive evaluation of environmental, economic, and social impact uh, associated with a product or material throughout the entire life cycle. Okay. Uh, so this is. Uh, the relationship relationship of SDG and nanocomposite. So there are 
uh, many relationship of SDG and nano composite, but I only took I only took three because uh, this is the simple one, and we can uh, memorize it if if we uh, read for uh, only three hour, and we can yes, we can we can understand. So. Uh, so basically, uh, if you guys know SDG is what, so uh, uh, <laughs> pardon me, I'm sorry. So I will explain about SDG. So what is SDG? SDG is Sustain Sustainability Development Goals, uh, which is uh, made by United Nations to achieve the economic, social, and development of the world. Uh, so the first one that I took is clean water and sanita sanitation which is SDG 6. So, uh, what, what can nanocomposite use for the clean water and sanitation? Uh, nanocomposite can be used uh, a nano, nanoparticle uh, embedded in, in, in composite can help remove contaminants such as heavy metals and, and organic pollutants from water, water sources uh, so, uh, these materials can also enhance the efficiency of filtration system. So, by, by this clean water and sanitation, we can get uh, an affordable and clean water. Uh, so, for the second one, uh, which is affordable and clean energy. So, a nano composite uh, can improve energy storage and conversion system. Uh, for example, nano composite can be uh, used uh, in the lithium ion batteries, which can expand the uh, uh, life drain of the battery and uh, example like a, a, a phone battery uh, if we have such as uh, 4000 mAh we can increase it by 5000 if we use the nano composite uh, like this so uh, this environment can support the widespread adoption of renewable energy sources so for the third one is innovation uh, Supposedly, it has industry, innovation, and infra infrastructure. I don't know why the first one is missing. So, <laughs> this is SDG 9. So, uh, nano composite offers numerous possibilities for improving the performance and sustainability of various industry. So, basically, uh, nano composite can be used in the, uh, such as uh, the material for car. So, we can make the uh, car more, more more light and for for example like F1 ah, if we want to uh, it become fast we, uh, we need to use uh, nano composite so it will become light and faster uh, so okay so they can be used to develop lightweight and high strength material for transportation construction and manufacturing centers okay I think that's all from me I will pass to the next presenter okay for the next one is for the next one is application of sustainable nanocomposites of what for water purification process. Uh, lately, in recent years, there are like uh, rapid industrial development and urbanization, population increase, and also climate change has uh, contribute everything towards water resource contamination. In recent years, that water purification methods are the focus and attention of many many scientists and governments agencies. It, this is because due to the great surface area, high chemical reactivity, excellent mechanical strength, and low cost, nanoscale composites material offer a significant potential to cleanse water in a variety of ways. And also due to the precise binding activities for like chelation, absorption, and ion exchange, nanocomposites are clever in their ability to remove bacteria, viruses, inorganic or organic contaminants from wastewater. Metal nanocomposite, metal oxide nanocomposite, carbon nanocomposite, polymer nanocomposite, and also membrane nanocomposite are just a few examples of the nanocomposite materials that play a significant role in water purification. And for the second one, second one is polymer nanocomposite ex exhibit unique, unique physical chemical properties that cannot be obtained with individual components acting alone. For example, polymer nanocomposites have attracted significant research interest due to the promising potential for versatile applications ranging from environmental remedi remediation, energy storage, 
electromagnetic EM absorption sensing and actuation transportation and etc in particular polymer nanocomposites have attracted intensive research in interest for solving both energy and environmental issues there are three latest development in polymer nanocomposites for applications in energy storage for example electrochemical capacitors and batteries like this one this one and second one is energy conservation, for example, electrochromic devices and carbon dioxide capture, which is this one. And lastly is anti-corrosion, for example, conductive and non-conductive polymer, nanocomposite, anti-corrosive coating, coatings, for example, in use in paint. I will pass in to the next slide. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, today I will present about transparent nanocomposite based on cellulose produced by bacteria offer potential innovation in the electronic device industry. So first and foremost, what is transparent nanocomposite? Transparent nanocomposite is a nanocomposite that show transparency, allow light to pass through with minimal scattering or absorption. So one of the transparent nanocomposite is bacteria cellulose pellicle consists of a layered structure of plana nanofiber networks uh, which enable the production of optically transparent composite with an ultra low coefficient of thermal expansion comparable to that of silicon crystal. Uh, so what is plana nanofiber network? So this is a nanofiber network and this is plana nanofiber network. So plana nanofiber network is a nanofiber that are orderly arranged in plana configura configuration and parallel to each other and uh, plana nanofiber network makes uh, has huge impact in the material functionalities and properties. So what about uh, ultra low coefficient of thermal expansion? BC is uh, better than silicon crystal in the term of thermal expansion because uh, BC is made of parallel plana nanofiber network and it has uh, highly pure highly pure crystalline structure. So uh, the BC nanofiber network suppress crack propagation in the brittle metric resin, resulting in composite that can be bent without damage. So why uh, BC can suppress crack propagation in the brittle metric resin? This is because uh, BC is uh, enhanced toughness, fiber metric interface, and fiber pull out and debonding. That, that's all from me. Thank you. So oh, next one is the sustainability on 3D printing. Before we go any further, we're going to go a bit recap on 3D printing. So what is 3D printing? 3D printing is a, is a method to create three-dimensional objects layer by layer using computer. In simple terms, uh, 3D printing is just like normal printing. The difference is 3D printing doesn't use color in cartridges like normal printing does, but it uses special printing material which, call, which is called filament. And 3D printing doesn't print text, document, or images like normal printing, but it prints a whole real life model from the computer. So the next one I'm going to pass. So, Smekom. So uh, don't worry, my part has so many pictures, so it will not be gloomy. Uh. So uh, I will talk about 3D printing sustainabilities. So what is sustainability actually? So sustainability is actually uh, avoidance, avoidance, uh, avoidance to uh, the natural resources to deplete in order to prevent natural uh, disasters, disasters. So this is uh, Charles Hall. Charles Hall is the person who invented Stereolithography. Uh, so that is basically a 3D printing machine. 
So the first sustainability that I found is about material efficiency. Material efficiency is uh, actually where we use, uh, we, uh, no, material efficiency means uh, when we uh, producing that thing, the end product, but we the, the end product will still be the same uh, without uh, having any material reducing issues or using lower grade uh, materials. So that is what is material efficiency. So the relation with sustainability is 3D printing enables precise material deposition, reducing waste compared to traditional manufacturing process, such as uh, we learned before, which is ceramic, ceramic clay. Uh, the traditional way we we uli that thing, knead, knead, K-N-E-A-D, we need that thing to become the ceramic pot. Eh? Uh, that's the traditional way, but obviously it's very slow and not as efficient as 3D printing. Additive manufacturing allows for the use of only the necessary amount of material, uh, minimizing excess waste and reducing material consumption. Uh, the second one is localized production. What is localized production? Localized production uh, by means is uh, for example, Malaysia. Okay, so if we have 3D printing in Malaysia, so we just um, we invent, uh, we invent, we produce that thing only in Malaysia. So uh, based on what it's uh, stated there, 3D printing allows for decentralized and localized production, reducing the need for long distance, long distance transportations of goods. This can lower carbon emissions associated with logistics and supply chains. So if we have a 3D printing, Malaysia, a 3D printing in Malaysia, so we don't have to uh, import uh, uh, from other countries because that will cost uh, the boats and some of the, the ships. Some of the ships cause uh, big smokes and that cause carbon emission. And the third one, recycling. Uh. See, there's a picture of recycling. Recycling and circular economy. So some 3D printing technologies, such as filament-based filament, filament -based printing, uh, this is filament, allow for the use of recycled materials. So how, we, how, how I say that this, uh, 3D printing can be recycled. Uh. So uh, for example, like this 3D filament-based material, so when you create a model from 3D printing, yeah? so it made from plastic or any other plastic, you can simply recycle it and become colorful like this. Uh, so there's a process for it, I don't know. And like that are uh, the flow. So by incorporating recycled plastics or metals into the printing process, the overall, the overall environmental impact can be reduced promoting a circular economy approach. The next is reduced tooling. Uh, reduced tooling means, uh, just like I mentioned earlier on, on material efficiency. So reduced tooling here, uh, by means is we use less, less tools to produce that thing. Uh, it's the same example as uh, the pot, the pot kneading. Uh, so to make that thing, it took a lot of time. It took a lot of time and took a lot of material. So simply with 3D printing, we can just make a model inside the CAD, eh? computer-aided drawing, and then pam, we get the model. So traditional manufacturing often requires the production of molds, uh, dies, and other tooling equipment, which can be resource intensive. In contrast, 3D printing eliminates the need for many of these tools, reducing waste costs and energy consumption. Okay, so the next thing is the relationship between 3D printing with SDGs. So as an IIUM student, we need to know what is SDG is because our university support this 100%. So actually there are many SDGs that can be related with, but uh, I don't want many SDG came into the final exam, so I state three only. <laughs> so the first SDG is the nine SDG. The nine, and this, uh, the nine SDG is industry, innovation, and infrastructure. 
So when you hear 3D printing is already uh, sound futuristic, isn't it? Uh. So 3D printing is a transformative technology that promotes innovation in manufacturing and reduce the need for traditional infrastructure, just like the ceramic thing just I mentioned just now. Uh, but it's true. Uh, if you remember on our past class, um, Sir, uh, Sir mentioned about the production of production of clay, uh, clay pot, something like that. Uh, do you remember when we finish that thing, we need to put it under a hot pot? But that hot pot also need to be ceramic because uh, even metal can stand the heat uh, for the clay pot to become uh, hardened. Uh, so that take time and also leceh, leceh, and very. Mm. <laughs> it enable, enables the decentralization of production, fostering local industries and supporting technological advancement in various sectors. Uh, the next SDG is the 12th SDG, Responsible Consumption and Production. 3D printing allows for on-demand production, reducing waste and overproduction. Because using 3D printing, as I said, by using CAD, when we model that, uh, that, that the product that we want to uh, produce, eh? So we will model it uh, precisely and accurately. So no, uh, no materials will be wasted, um, and it's very effective. Uh. Uh, it promotes co sustainable consumption by enabling customization and localized manufacturing, which can lead to efficient resource utilization and lower carbon emissions. The last SDG is the 13th SDG, climate action. 3D printing promotes climate action by reducing carbon emission associated with transportation and supply chains. Just like I mentioned in localized, localized uh, production just now, where we can uh, reduce the distance for materials to be transported from this to there. So localized production are here. And material efficiency contribute to a lower environmental footprint making 3D printing a potential tool for sustainable manufacturing and mitigating mitigating climate change. What is mitigating? Uh, mitigating in Malaysia, uh, in Malay, we call it uh, kurang, mengurangkan, mengurangkan climate change. In Bangladesh, uh, uh, <laughs> mitigating is uh, we, lesser, we lesser climate change. So I move to... Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, all of my group mates discussed about the process and how it uh, helps us to reach the goal of SDGs like uh, SDG 6, 7 and SDG uh, 9 that reaches with the nanocomposites and also they have discussed like uh, SDG 9, SDG 12 and SDG 13. These three goals uh, uh, they can reach with the uh, 3D printing and we can clearly have a view here that uh, mechanical strength, while we have the mechanical strength better than the normal, uh, normal particle in the nanocomposite because it gives more strength while making this type of uh, uh, aeroplanes or also the cars, we can have better strength. And this type of uh, strength and this type of uh, vehicles have also the recycle ability, also simplicity and flexibility. And we can get the lightweight of the vehicles better than the other particles using. While we use nanocomposite, this nanocomposite uh, meets up the demand of the SDGs. Here we can say that uh, SDG 6 is uh, fulfilled and clean water and sanitization. Uh, we can purify the water, maintaining nanocomposites and also the affordable and clean energy, how we can get affordable and clean energy using lithium ion batteries. We have discussed it previously. Also industry innovation, what is industry innovation? We have talked about uh, uh, bringing innovation in the sector of cars, in the sector of battery industries using nanocomposites and this type of uh, 
uh, renovation can be done in this sector using these nanocomposites. Okay, uh, now come to the conclusion of the 3D printing. Here we have discussed uh, SDZ9, SDZ12, and SDZ13. Actually, SDZ had 17 goals, and these 17 goals can be meet up using this type of uh, renovative things, this type of uh, uh, nature-friendly things, environment-friendly things, and more sustainable, how to make our environment more sustainable, how to make our life more sustainable. So we can make uh, the products using 3D printing and make the products uh, without uh, wasting, less wasting, means uh, if we have the less waste when we use the 3D printing. Actually, when you use the normal printing or when we use the normal procedure, we have a lot of waste. When we use the 3D printing, we have less waste. So we can uh, save different uh, purposes and also we can lower up the cost and also we have safer site. And this type of sustainability can be maintained using 3D printing. So we can see that uh, Using 3D printing, we have uh, fulfilling the SDG goals. So it is uh, helpful for us, and that's all from our group. Thank you.